Is this on? Good morning, everyone, and welcome to day two of the 8th International Symposium on Focused Ultrasound. My name is Lauren Polovich, and I'm the Associate Chief Medical Officer of the Foundation. This morning's focus is going to be on brain tumors and focused ultrasound mechanisms of action related to brain treatments like liquid biopsy and sonodynamic therapy. Um, I did just want to take a moment to remind you that all of the oral presentations have been recorded and made available to you on our platform, and I would highly encourage you to um, take a look at all of those wonderful uh, recordings that have, have been submitted by many different scientists and clinicians around the world and interact with, um, with the presenters virtually on the platform, or if you happen to see them in person here, that would be fantastic as well. So um, we really appreciate you guys taking the time to do that in your free time. Uh, to kick off today's sessions, we're going to have a stellar lineup for the glioblastoma panel discussion, which will be co-moderated by Drs. Jason Sheehan and Graham Woodworth. Um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sheehan and Woodworth. Dr. Sheehan is actually joining us virtually today and will be giving a brief overview of the, the state of the field for glioblastoma before diving into the panel discussion. Thank you, Dr. Woodworth and Dr. Sheehan. It's uh, my pleasure to join. Uh, um, and uh, the virtual presentation here today uh, is related to uh, focus ultrasound and, and specifically the approach to targeting and treating glioblastoma. I've been asked to provide a general overview and uh, recording um, and, in progress. And then we will keep uh, ample time for discussion. Next slide. Glioblastoma, by way of background, is the most common primary malignant brain tumor. Its incidence is relatively rare, 3.2 cases per 100,000 individuals. The median age of diagnosis is 64, uh, and it is slightly more common in men than women. Unfortunately, even given all that we've done in terms of research and, and advancing treatments and therapeutics, the median survival time for glioblastoma patients on average is about 15 months after the time of diagnosis. The tumor is a very infiltrative one. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the blood-brain barrier remains relatively intact, although it is semi-permeabilized around the tumor immediately. Uh, the tumor uh, blood-brain barrier environment is not one that allows for therapeutics to freely flow uh, uh, by the bloodstream into the tumor to uh, particularly effective or high concentrations. If one follows the news, even in general, uh, you can't help but recognize some of this, the celebrities uh, uh, and, and politicians uh, that have been affected by brain tumors. In particular, these three individuals shown here, Bo Biden, John McCain, and Teddy Kennedy, certainly uh, uh, were highly visible cases of, of glioblastoma. But there's thousands of other patients who remain faceless and nameless to the audience who are afflicted by this and don't uh, uh, get this, the same degree of attention, but suffer uh, as much or more than these gentlemen have. And we certainly need to try to advance our therapeutics. If we look at the standard of care for treatment for most brain tumors, um, it really is dependent upon the, the size of the tumor, uh, and the location, the type, and the overall grade. Although grade is a histological uh, uh, opinion and, and, and it's a, an assessment based upon the way the cells look. And increasingly, we're looking at mutational burdens and genetic manifestations that may allow us to target therapeutics. Whether or not the tumor resides solely in the brain or if it extends to the spine uh, or outside of the body uh, is another type of um, consideration. Possible side effects uh, uh, that may be manifested by the tumor itself, neurological deficits, or impairments, whether or not they have a seizure, weakness, numbness, visual impairments, uh, or neurocognitive issues at time of presentation all need to be factored in. Uh, uh, certainly the patient's goals uh, and their overall health are also considerations. And as you can see, we sort of can broadly class, uh, categorize treatment options as, as surgical or resective, radiation therapy, chemotherapy, or immunotherapy. And in fact, uh, they each have certain uh, strengths and, and weaknesses. Uh, some are more targeted, some are, are more invasive, some uh, can more easily be administered repeatedly, 
uh, and our ability to use these buckets or tools from these various buckets to, and carefully select them for patients is, is really uh, you know, some of what we're gonna be talking about in relationship to focus ultrasound today. Next slide. The current glioblastoma treatment options are, are as follows. On the left you'll, of this slide, you'll see a presentation. We typically try to achieve maximal safe resection. If that's not feasible, particularly considering that the biopsy may be deep seated, uh, uh, the tumor may be deep seated, we would simply pursue a biopsy. Neuronavigation, occasionally intraoperative MRI, and the use of 5-ALA, a, a floor floor that can light up the tumor when, when, uh, when the tumor uh, has a specific wavelength of light shining on it, can help to guide resection. It can also uh, be used for other purposes, as we'll talk about in the context of focus ultrasound. Fractionated radiation therapy and chemotherapy, typically oral chemotherapy, a drug called Temidar given afterwards. And the amount of radiation that we give is roughly about 60 gray. That's a, a fairly uh, a high dose that's given to the brain. Additional treatment options include tumor treatment fields. Uh, at the time of, of recurrence, the treatment paradigms vary more widely. Uh, repeat resection is sometimes considered. Occasion will biopsy to look and see whether or not there's mutational drift uh, of the tumor. Uh, one can consider uh, intravenous delivery of an anti-angiogenic therapy called Avastin. You can also deliver radiosurgery, a different form of focus radiation on top of the fractionated radiation therapy that patients have received before. Laser interstitial thermal therapy, uh, tumor treatment fields again, or you can consider enrolling patients on clinical trials. Next slide. Focus ultrasound uh, can either be viewed as an alternative or as a complementary approach to many of those treatments that are already considered standard of care for glioblastoma. Uh, focus ultrasound has the advantages that it's relatively non-invasive. It's a targeted approach in most instances. There aren't broad systemic therapy risks. It's, it's, um, it can be repeatedly applied. And if you look on the, the right-hand panel of this slide, you can see that the focus ultrasound uh, modalities that we consider uh, are, are broadly leveraging the mechanical or the thermal effects of focus ultrasound for treatment of glioblastoma through blood-brain barrier disruption, sonodynamic therapy, or radiosensitization. Although uh, other modalities have been considered, thermal ablation and hythotripsy, they're not actively being considered for the moment for glioblastoma, uh, but perhaps in the, uh, uh, in the near future on the horizon, they will be. Next slide. Uh, and if you'll advance the, to get all the pictures on, that would be wonderful uh, uh, there, but the, you probably have to hit the space bar or, or the mouse. Uh, thank you. The current focus ultrasound devices uh, are shown here. Those devices are currently being explored for glioblastoma treatments. On the left, you'll see the exoplate system, an intraop, uh, a, a real-time MRI, and a, a focus ultrasound array. Uh, currently, the, the stereotactic frame, that device is secured to the patient's cranium. Another system called SonoCloud, shown in the upper right-hand uh, portion of this slide, it's an implantable device that's used at the time of a craniotomy and oftentimes tumor resection. There's a microarray of ultrasound emitters, and then one can, can turn on or off those ultrasound emitters at the, uh, during various treatments, oftentimes for blood-brain barrier disruption. And then the lower right-hand panel of this slide, the Navifos system, is a frameless neuronavigation uh, delivered ultrasound array that's placed a, a near the cranium at the site of the tumor. And all these systems are being currently explored and we'll talk a little bit about those. Next slide. The, the first modality or, or therapeutic approach that's being explored the most heavily for glioblastoma is blood-brain barrier opening. Uh, although I don't, if you click the animation uh, on this slide, it shows that the, the blood-brain barrier is relatively intact on on the, uh, it, within the brain for glioblastoma patients. However, by using micro bubbles and, and oscillating those micro bubbles with ultrasound, you can stretch or open the blood brain barrier for a period of time. 
in the upper right hand portion of this slide, you'll see that this is really a mechanical property of ultrasound uh, and it uses relatively low power. In the histopathologic cross section of the brain shown in the lower right hand panel of this slide, uh, you'll note on the contralateral side, no appreciable uptake uh, and on the ultrasound side, a darkened signal reflecting blood brain barrier disruption and uptake within the brain parenchyma at the site of uh, ultrasound targeting. In other words, the permeabilization of the blood brain barrier and delivery of a payload, if you will, to the, to the site of the uh, uh, targets within the brain. Next slide. This is just a summary of the various uh, blood brain barrier opening focus ultrasound trials for glioblastoma that uh, are either currently accruing or, or uh, plan to be accruing in the near future. Um, if you'll hit the, the uh, space bar or mouse, uh, you'll note that the therapeutics uh, that are targeted so far are largely Temidar, Avastin, Carboplatin, and Paxitil. Uh, these are uh, chemotherapeutic agents that do get it across the blood-brain barrier, but, to, uh, but we know for a fact that if we are able to get them across to a greater degree, they have a broader and more potent therapeutic effect on glioblastoma uh, itself. Next slide. The, the next modality that's being explored currently for focus ultrasound treatment of glioblastoma is sonodynamic therapy. Sonodynamic therapy is broadly a uh, use of a non-toxic substance called a sonosensitizer. It can be given to a patient, um, oftentimes orally, occasionally intravenously. 5-LA is the sonosensitizer that's being explored uh, most currently for focus ultrasound applications for glioblastoma. As you may recall, I mentioned earlier that 5-LA is currently FDA approved for use intraoperatively for guidance of glioblastoma resection. It can help to light up the tumor and guide the surgeon as we're performing these resections. 5-LA is also an asano sensitizer that, that can be uh, activated, if you will, uh, within the cells of glioblastoma uh, uh, tumors. The sonosensitizer, when uh, uh, activated by ultrasound, shown in the lower right-hand panel, induces a complex uh, uh, set of intracellular mechanisms that generate reactive oxygen species and cause uh, cellular damage, leading oftentimes to tumorcidal effects. In the upper right-hand panel, you'll note that this is a mechanical property of ultrasound, and it uses slightly more power than blood brain barrier disruption. Next slide. Uh, my, my team, including Dr. Prada, had, had looked at and, and shown that, that the use of 5-LA and, and powers uh, that are typically accustomed for using sonodynamic therapy was relatively safe in, in a uh, porcine model. And we published this in Frontiers in Oncology about a year ago. Uh, these are some of the sonodynamic therapy trials on the lower portion of, the, of this slide that are looking at and currently accruing patients with high-grade gliomas um, and using sonodynamic therapy. Uh, principally, these are using either intravenous 5-LA or orally administered 5-LA. Next slide. And then uh, finally, uh, ultrasound is being explored as a means of radiosensitization. That means of radiosensitization can either occur by a mild hyperthermia a, a, a slight temperature increase in the brain uh, at the level of the tumor can cause radiosensitization or by uh, uh, activating micro bubbles and, and oscillating them within the tumor, leading to uh, activation of ceramide pathways, possibly vascular changes and, and a radiosensitization effect, thereby allowing the ionizing radiation that we already give either at the time of initial presentation after resection or at the time of recurrence to be more effective on glioblastomas. And then also hopefully minimizing the risks of radionecrosis and, and late-term radiation effects in the nearby brain parenchyma. This is one trial shown in the lower portion of this slide uh, that is currently using a focus ultrasound approach for radiosensitization in glioblastoma with the Navifa system. Next slide. So, uh, uh, in summary, Focus Ultrasound offers a number of unique therapeutic potentials for glioblastoma patients, including blood brain barrier disruption for chemotherapy and immunotherapy, sonodynamic therapy 
radiosensitization, either by mild hyperthermia or by micropubble oscillation. And although I'm not going to discuss this today, there'll be another panel that will talk about this later, but focus ultrasound is also being used or being explored as a means of, uh, of allowing liquid biopsies for patients with glioblastoma. Uh, next steps really are, are to complete current uh, clinical trials and to work more closely with pharmaceutical and radiation therapy industries and to better improve our therapeutic tracking of, of the effects in blood brain barrier disruption. Next slide. The, uh, the panelists today, I'm, I'm delighted to be a part of this, are uh, Dr. Lipsum from Sunnybrook is joining us to discuss focus ultrasound and glioblastoma, a real pioneer in the field. Dr. Palagata is not able to join us today. Dr. Prada is in person. Uh, a, a good friend and colleague who um, has advanced the field of ultrasound and sonodynamic therapy for glioblastoma. Dr. Sonabend, who's done uh, so much in the field and has worked uh, closely with his team in Northwestern to advance the Cloud9 system. And Dr. Chen um, uh, from uh, Taiwan, who uh, ha has exquisite knowledge on the Navifest system, is also going to be joining us today. And my co-moderator, uh, Dr. Woodworth, uh, who is a pioneer in focus ultrasound and has done many of the uh, uh, early trials in glioblastoma and is an active investigator in the lab as well from the University of Maryland. I'd like to acknowledge the, the tremendous support of putting this workshop together, Dr. Polovich, uh, uh, Ms. Batia, and Dr. Tim Timby from the Focus Ultrasound Foundation, who were scientific leads in this session. Next slide. So with that, we have some, uh, we did have a pre-meeting and we're, we're trying to arrive at some burning questions. Next slide. This will serve as a template for us to, to launch from as we have the discussion today. And I'll turn this over to Dr. Woodworth, who's there in person to start with the questions. Great, uh, thank you so much, Dr. Sheehan. Uh, really appreciate that comprehensive overview of the field, which is clearly expanding in new, exciting ways. So I thought we could kick off this panel with um, a overview from each of the panelists of where they are with each of their clinical trials, given most of this group is actively involved in, in some of these exciting clinical trials that Dr. Sheehan mentioned in the overview. So maybe let's start with Dr. Sonobin, who's joining us from Northwestern. Can you give us a quick overview of where you are with your clinical trials? Sure, first of all, thank you, Graham and, and the foundation and, and Jason for this interesting uh, discussion. So we, we have, as, as you mentioned, been using this uh, implantable ultrasound system, SonoCloud9, and we just finalized a phase one in which we did a uh, dose escalation of albumin band paclitaxel, which is a drug that traditionally has been shown not to cross the blood-brain barrier. Uh, and it's a drug that is already highly potent for glioblastomas in vitro and is used for other uh, malignancies. So we were able to escalate to the highest dose level. We tried six different dose levels and we observed one DLT. This was a grade three encephalopathy across 12 patients during the DLT period. A second patient had one, but was milder. It was completely reversible. And so based on that, we have now finalized this trial and established this highest dose level as the safe dose for a phase two that we recently opened. The other uh, small point to make is uh, during this study, we were able to uh, investigate the direct effects of this ultrasound technology and the peritumoral brain, not the enhancing tumor, but the actual brain. And we observed, uh, we did this for two separate drugs and we observed anywhere between four to six fold increase in absolute drug levels in the human brain. Great, uh, thanks Dr. Sonaben, that was great. And the two drugs again are the, um, you said the Braxane and what was the second one? So yeah, so clarify, the Abraxin is the drug we use on this trial, but on a separate trial in collaboration with our uh, colleagues from Carthera, we, we also investigated carboplatin. Carboplatin, okay, great. Dr. Lipsman, do you want to give us a quick overview of where you are with clinical trials? Uh, sure, and uh, thank you, Jason, and thank you, uh, Graham, the Focus Ultrasound Foundation, for um, the opportunity to take part. Congratulations also, uh, Graham, on your award, which is very well-deserving. Um, so we've been working uh, with Insight Tech on the Exoblate uh, 220 uh, now for uh, several years. Uh, our first experience uh, was with the BBB opening uh, in Dr. Rubison several years ago in a phase one trial. And 
you know, ba based on the quite compelling safety data there that we saw, we expanded this to to a, a multi center trial that Graham, uh, you were uh, University of Maryland and others are are involved with, where we use focus ultrasound uh, as part of uh, Timidar uh, enhancement delivery in patients undergoing maintenance chemotherapy. Uh, so that that trial uh, recently concluded and it's currently being analyzed and also uh, demonstrated quite compelling safety data, well tolerated procedures uh, with quite interesting uh, results that we're currently analyzing. Uh, we're very um, uh, quite interested in recurrent GBM as well. And there I uh, had a trial where we were delivering carboplatin patients with recurrent GBM. Uh, and there too, um, we're quite successful in recruiting recruiting uh, patients to that trial, uh, and gradually escalated the dose uh, in terms of the volume of BBB being opened. And now, um, uh, it really, it's quite a different procedure uh, than we were doing several years ago with much larger volumes and a much more efficient procedure over the last uh, few years. Um, again, I know there's going to be a liquid biopsy uh, session later on, but we. Currently, our GBM work is focused on um, enriching cell free DNA in peripheral, in peripheral plasma preoperatively uh, in patients undergoing surgery for de novo GBM. So that work is currently uh, underway as well in a recently launched, uh, recently launched study. So currently, we're, we're, we're quite interested in covering the full spectrum of GBM from, from diagnosis to, to uh, upfront treatment to maintenance and ultimately to uh, recurrence uh, as well. Great. Thanks, Nir. Dr. Chen, do you want us to give a quick update on your clinical trials? Um, yes. Okay. Thank you for this opportunity. Uh, we already finished our phase one trial with safety using in uh, recurrent GBM patients since 2019. And uh, the current trial we are ab about to close is the com combination of Navy First system with Bibacizumab. Uh, to enhance the drug delivery into the tumor margin. And the uh, treatment protocol was bi-weekly, um, uh, the, uh, the, the combination of FAST and BEV. So the duration the tr of the treatment will be, uh, would, uh, was 9.5 months. Uh, how the results are that uh, we have six recurrent GBM patients, uh, received totally 154 uh, uh, Fox ultrasound treatments, which makes that uh, a 13.5 treatments per patient. And each treatment, we have two sonications. And the results show that uh, five of six patients has progression-free in six months, making the six months progression-free survival of 83%, which uh, is quite um, better than the historical control. However, the, the cohort is quite small, so we need a larger phase three trial to prove this. Thank you. And just to clarify, that, that trial is in the setting of recurrent tumors or? Yeah, yeah or recurrent rec tumors. Recurrent tumors, okay, yeah. thank you. Okay, Dr. Prada, can you give us an update on your trial? Sure, <clears throat> thank you for the opportunity as well. So in Milano, we are uh, currently uh, using the Cetex system. Uh, with, the, of course, the low-frequency low system. Um, we closed the, the, we attended and, uh, and closed two trial on blood-brain barrier opening, uh, where the PI is uh, Professor Di Meco, who also managed to bring the system in Milano. Um, the first uh, trial was the BBB opening maintenance with uh, after surgery for, with uh, temozolomide where we enrolled three patients, and then uh, the other uh, trial was the recurrent GBM, in recurrent GBM um, with the cheese platin, administering cheese platin. Um, we are also about to start uh, um, a trial on sonodynamic therapy using uh, 5LA in a newly diagnosed uh, glioblastoma. Great, thank you. Um, there's, a, there's a question from the audience for uh, Dr. Sanaben in the chat here. So the question is, how does a fourfold or approximately four, fourfold increase in the paclitaxel translate into uh, the, the total amount of tissue or drug in the tissue over time? Do you have any sense for that from the studies you've done so far? Yeah, I think this is a, one of those uh, burning questions that everybody talks about. It, Unfortunately, the way we designed the study, we, we really look at drug levels at one time point, which was at 45 minutes. Uh, 
after sonication, and, and that's when we observe this uh, fold increase. I do think it's really important to ask the question whether drugs stay, once you, the barrier closes, stay in the brain for longer than they would otherwise. That, that's a question I, I, I really love to, to get at, but I don't have an answer for that at this point. Great, thank you. Another key difference is a lot of these trials, or each of these trials, are using different devices. And a question with especially BBB opening is, what is the optimal target, or, or how do we even define the, the target zone for the treatments? So can each of us uh, sort of give an overview of, of how that's thought about in the context of it, the, these different devices that have different targeting or focusing strategies? Dr. Chen, do you want to start that? Okay, for, for our device, um, because we currently include only recurrent GBM patients who received uh, the second resection surgery, and uh, our team is quite aggressive on resection all the enhanced tumor, making that the uh, residual tumor is minimally enhanced or even not enhanced. So our strategy is quite uh, similar to the radiotherapy, which makes that the we plus maybe two centimeters uh, uh, along the resection margin. However, the current technical uh, problem is that we could not produce large enough uh, region of interest in one session of treatment. So maybe this will be the future to, to conquer this kind of uh, the RIs, the size of the RIs, and also to uh, optimize the uh, protocol of the treatment to cover as much of the resection margin as possible. Mm -hmm. and, and by margin, do you mean a certain distance from the resection cavity, or how are you defining that, that marginal Yeah, region? like quite like one or two centimeters from the resection margin to cover immediate mm -hmm. to the resection margin and uh, plus one to two centimeters. Okay, okay. Dr. Lipsman, how, how do you think about targeting and, and the, the region of, of uh, giving a given uh, ultrasound effect? Very similar. Uh, we also target um, one to two centimeters beyond the resection margin uh, or the tumor margin where most of the recurrences will take place. Uh, to Jason's point earlier, uh, we know that there is partial BBB breakdown uh, at the barrier, uh, at the tumor barrier. So we target uh, just beyond it as well um, with the goal of, of potentially uh, getting cells and tissue that is uh, beyond the margin. Thank you. <clears throat> and, and let me add, ask you a question, uh, sure. it, it, if, I, if I can, uh, uh, to the past two speakers, uh, when you're targeting beyond that, are you using flare signal or, or T2 signal to help to guide you, or are you using diffusion tensor imaging or, or, or uh, ADC mapping to, to help to guide you as you look at the white matter pathways that are uh, extending beyond the enhancing tissue or the tumor bed? Flare helps, uh, and we look at, I mean, under the assumption that there's, uh, there are set tumor cells there, there are pathologic processes there for sure. So that, that for us is very helpful uh, to know just how far. Now, sometimes, as you know, with these tumors, you can see flare way beyond where the tumor is. You can see it extending into the corpus callosum. You can see it in, in regions uh, beyond that. So there we really have a balance of, you know, how, how efficient we can be, how, how long the procedure is, and, and try to, to maximize what we can in terms of patient tolerability and, uh, and how well they're doing with the machine under the assumption that more is probably better uh, and uh, based on our experience, um, safe as well. So flare, flare is very helpful. Dr. Chen, do you also use uh, flare sequencing, or, or are you simply doing a, a, a treatment volume expansion beyond the resection cavity? Yeah, we have similar strategy as Dr. Liftman that we use flare to guide our uh, treatment focus. Uh, and, and we've done similar sorts of approaches here too. So, but I'm, I'm pleased. I think that that uh, uh, the more consistency that's going on, the better with regard to these trials. Thank you. Okay. Just to reassure Dr. Sheehan, yes, in Milan we, we try to follow as much as possible the flare signal as well when planning the sonication. And uh, one other um, element to be taken into account because we want to treat the larger volume possible uh, is patient compliance, which is not of, often the case. So, yeah, 
this tend to be one of the other factors that we need to take into account, not for planning, but for the whole treatment. And Adam, for you, how, how does it work with the SonaCloud system for targeting? So it's a good question. You know, I think the principles are very similar to what my colleagues are discussing, but the, the logistics are very different because we, we don't get to choose the target every time we sonicate. So you have to think about it in the preoperative setting. And so I think, of course, we, we have a very nice large volume of uh, sonication, but it's still limited. I wish it was larger. So I think what's key in our trials is patient selection and try to find tumors where the one to two centimeter radius around the resection cavity would fit in the prism that we can sonicate. Mm -hmm. uh, I wish we could target flare, but in the preoperative scan, a lot of the flare represents edema. And, and often this flare will actually, uh, you know, improve in the next few weeks post-operatively. So we've gone strictly by the one to two centimeter radius based on this literature that 80 to 90% of recurrences occur there. If there's a multifocal tumor or a tumor that extends beyond that, we, we tend to exclude that patient from the trial because we're trying to prove a principle, right? And once we can prove the principle, then you can maybe scale up with further volume. Thank you. So. So with this technique for blood-brain barrier disruption, we're, we're looking to achieve a given bioeffect as measured right now by most of us using new contrast enhancement on a post-treatment MRI scan. However, we often see a relatively heterogeneous new contrast enhancement signal and maybe giving different amounts of energy to achieve that signal. Are there other ways to measure such a desired bioeffect, number one? And number two, is there some sort of a dose or, or input parameter that we should be using to standardize a given treatment? Nir, do you want to take that? Uh, it's a great question, you know, and it relates to one, you know, one of the burning questions that I have. Um, and of course, we're in a field where there are more questions than answers right now. Um, is how, how we define outcomes, uh, you know, not only radiographically, but clinically. Um, to your second point, what we found is a large degree of variability in terms of, um, you know, cavitation doses that we can use that maybe lead to, um, you know, different degrees of BBB opening. And it depends a lot on the tissue uh, that we're sonicating. Um, to us, it underscores the importance of sort of real-time safety mitigation strategies, whether it's imaging during the procedure or, you know, real-time ability to measure uh, cavitation doses, just because, you know, previously radiated tissue, highly vascularized tissue, um, uh, gray matter versus white matter necrosis, uh, swelling, swollen brain, et cetera, all of these are going to be factors that determine how effective the BBB uh, will be open. Uh, and for how long and what you can get in. Um, so I think that, yeah, uniformity is great, uh, you know, across across centers and across uh, trials that are doing this, but we're still determining sort of what factors determine that. Um, and um, I think that, you know, we're, we're, we're still at that stage. So, you know, forums like this and, 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 and consortia like this are, are critical. Um, and it, as well as partnership with, with the technical team, the physics team to, to help sort of as much as possible determine, you know, if we can, you know, and even if it means, you know, algorithmically to do this, you know, what factors determine, you know, to what extent the BBB can be open and, and, and correlate that with the imaging features that we see. And right now it's going to be contrast enhancement uh, with BBB opening. Um, so so that, that would be my, my preference, double down uh, and a lot, you know, on the work that a lot of people in this group are doing and many groups around the world are doing, on and figuring out what technical factors influence uh, BBB opening, specifically uh, in, in previously irradiated, operated, uh, and treated swollen brain. Great. Dr. Prada, do you want to, to uh, address that question of, of the uh, approach to assessing the degree of blood brain barrier opening with contrast enhanced MRI or other means? and then achieving a certain dose or input parameter to accomplish such an effect? Sure, so uh, in our protocol, we perform a, a post-operative, uh, uh, we, we, we assess with the MRI at the end of the procedure the, uh, the opening of the BBB, and uh, usually we use uh, uh, flare sequences, uh, gadolinium enhancement in order to uh, evaluate the extravasation 
of, uh, of, the, of, the, of the agent and uh, uh, SWI uh, sequences to evaluate uh, uh, extravasation of a blood uh, byproduct. Um, I think uh, one of the um, parameters to optimize uh, um, the, 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 this procedure is also to take into account the distribution of the microbubble, um, which is, uh, um, of course, uh, uh, performed during the procedure with the uh, acoustic cavitation uh, detection uh, to measure the bubble activity. Mm -hmm. uh, it, we don't have a, a real parameter. We, can lock, we cannot localize uh, during the procedure the microbubble. Uh, therefore, we are also performing a study uh, at, in our institute uh, looking at the microbubble while we perform um, uh, uh, open surgery, so not during this procedure, and uh, we found that there is a correlation uh, with uh, um, the perfusion MR. Mm -hmm. So eventually, uh, from a qualitative standpoint, uh, I can tell you that there is a truly a correlation in the dynamics of the distribution. We're also performing a quantitative study, so eventually um, MR perfusion can become a non-invasive biomarker to be performed prior to BBB opening and can guide the, uh, and tailor the, uh, the acoustic dose in certain areas. Got it. And Adam, how, how do you think about that in terms of how long to keep the device on and, and then assessing a post-treatment uh, effect? And are there times that you have to go back and retreat before you'll give drug or, or anything like that that happens with the, the SonoCloud device? Yeah, thank you for the question. It's interesting as I hear my colleagues, the, the, I guess the approach we use is, is different in the sense that the, the energy doesn't have to cross the skull. So this is a very low energy, similar to the parameters that are used for diagnostic ultrasound. And uh, we keep them fixed. This is the one thing that the, our colleagues from Carthera had established on, on a parameter optimization clinical trial that they, they completed prior. And I think we get a very consistent above 90% um, of the times good blood brain barrier opening with MRIs done post uh, sonication every time. So we don't really routinely check for every cycle. Um, we have done as an orthogonal approach to see and characterize, but this is more for science than for, for uh, quality assurance. Uh, intraoperative sonications where we use fluorescent. and I know you, you've also uh, investigated this and it's a great a visual way to assess that this technology is actually opening the blood brain barrier when you look at the actual brain. But we don't we don't routinely, at least in my trial, check every sonication to make sure that it, it works. If there's any technical issues with the device, we will get an error message. But I think I'm, I'm building on, on the work already done by my colleagues where they already established the, the, the I guess, the batting rate of this uh, technique. The, the sonication procedure in our case takes about four minutes. And it's designed so that the microbubble injection is uh, very nicely timed. The machine tells you when you need to start injecting, when you need to stop injecting. And it's done so that over a period of four minutes, the, the microbubbles are circulating and, and the ultrasound probes are, are turned on. Great. And Dr. Chen, how about you? Are you using post-treatment MRI scans to assess all of your patients? and? If you don't see blood-brain barrier disruption in a patient, are you retreating and then uh, giving the therapeutic? Yeah, for, for that kind of points, we are quite similar to Dr. Adam um, because our system is not incorporated with MRI, so we could not, and uh, in, during our workflow, we did not use uh, every time the post MRI to check if BBB was opened. But uh, initially, we do check the parameters and importantly, we use acoustic emission feedback control system to, uh, to detect the, the backscatter of the uh, emission uh, signal during the uh, treatment. So it gives us uh, some sense of uh, the energy display and the uh, safety of the patients. Great, thank you. An another key question that comes up a lot in our studies is um, the duration of blood-brain barrier opening and, and with that, the, the timing of therapeutic delivery. Since we're talking now about tumor-infiltrated brain, which may behave more uh, or differently than a, the native brain, 
historically work by Nathan McDonald and Claire Vohinen and others have, have shown that the duration of BBB opening using this technique is around four to six hours. But in this different context, do, do, has anyone had experience looking at the duration of BBB opening or the timing of drug delivery to optimize uh, the effects of a given therapeutic? Dr. Lipsman, I know you've done some work on this. You want to take that first? Yeah, um, it, it varies for sure. Uh, and I think that, um, you know, we've done some, some you know, w when we do our post-operative MRs, um, usually 24 hours post-procedure, um, the vast majority of the time the BBB is closed. And again, we do a, a, a contrast-enhanced scan immediately after the procedure as a basis of comparison. But it, but it varies, and, and there are variables. Uh, and, you know, I alluded to those earlier, and it has to do with... Um, uh, tumor tissue, uh, where you're sonicating, you know, and, and the degree of edema that's in the area, all of these are going to factor in how effective you open the BBB and how effective it's closed again. We're not talking about normal, in quotes, brain here. Um, you know, and, and I, and I can't, and, you know, I'm specifically thinking of other trials where we're doing it in, in patients maybe with neurodegenerative disease, and, and certainly there it's not normal brain either, but Structurally, we're talking about a different, a different kind of situation here. So, um, you know, we do believe that it's, it's, it remains a reversible, uh, temporary process. When you deliver that therapeutic, though, is key to to consider because I think that as soon as it's open, it's in the process of closing. So I think that it's critical that you that you that you maximize the amount of therapeutic you deliver by having it either on board. Uh, at the time of opening the BBB or shortly, uh, as soon as possible afterwards, uh, um, because then uh, you risk uh, not, uh, not achieving the aim that you want to achieve. Yeah, I, I'd like to add, I mean, totally 100% agree with Nir on this. Uh, we've done some initial studies and, you know, I was surprised. I, I, we really see a restoration of the blood-brain barrier and, and decreasing permeability within the first hour. Uh, so, I think it's really interesting when we look at at least a few drugs that we, we we investigated. The peak plasma levels of these drugs are immediately after uh, the end of their infusion. And so, I think there's a risk if this is not timed perfectly or with oral agents to up in the barrier when the drug is not in the plasma or or, or vice versa. So I, I think this is a really important question. It might be also technology dependent, I would admit. Great, thank you. We've, we've got a question here from Dr. Frank. So uh, I have actually two or three questions here. Role of FDG PET in monitoring these patients because that's one of the ways we monitor brain tumors in the clinic. Uh, we actually get PET scans probably every quarter or every, at least every six months to see what's going on. It doesn't, you know, you can monitor the flare sequence and, uh, and what the invasion is, but, you know, right now there's MR PET scanners that you can actually do the fusion of the two and actually look at the hyper, hypermetabolic areas to see exactly where you want to treat and how you would want to treat with a potentially focused ultrasound. I think that's something that's missing. From these, from these discussions. Number one, we have two, basically two things that are going on here. You have a, a basically a pressure monitoring system and the amount of bubbles. How are you gonna give the bubbles? What are the best way you're gonna give the bubbles to open to maximize opening the blood-brain barrier uh, and actually wind up uh, getting the most drug bang for your buck into the tumor? because if you think a bolus injection or multiple bolus injections may be good and you maybe ha get a minute and a half worth of before it's, they start to clear because of just the first pass kinetics going through the lungs, how are you gonna actually maximize that and when you start your actually f uh, your fuss or your sonication in the brain? So those are things that I think we need to consider here um, in trying to treat the brain tumor and trying to deliver more drug or more gene or more cell therapy to the area which will actually cause more cell death. But clearly, you're, you, you're not utilizing one major technique that's used in radiology, which is essentially the FDG PET to basically monitor your effect. Mm -hmm. Great. So two great questions. Thanks, Dr. Frank. And I think the, the uh, question around the bubbles is a key question first. Let's see if we can take that as a first step. 
uh, <laughs> given there over time been different ways of delivering the bubbles, different doses of bubbles, and clearly the bubbles are a, a main contributor to the overall effect that we're, we're talking about here. So um, can, can each of us maybe give an overview of how we think about the bubble dose or infusion and the timing of sonications in that context? Jason, do you want to give a, a, a you know, start that and, and give us a sense for how you guys do it at UVA? I mean, our, our, I mean, first of all, I commend the, the Dr. Frank for uh, the, the pertinent questions. The, uh, uh, the question about micro bubble delivery, I think, is is uh, still unresolved. You know, how best do we give it? We've been giving it intravenously. Typically, um, uh, we'll do initial MRI sequencing on the patient with the um, and and uh, and then uh, infuse the micro bubbles about. Uh, 30 to 45 minutes in advance of, of uh, test sonications. The uh, infusion is usually uh, uh, given at a continuous rate uh, throughout the procedure. It's not given in a bolus dose. Uh, and uh, uh, that's that's the approach we've taken in preclinical uh, models as well. Uh, just in brief, I mean, I think it's uh, uh, touching upon the FDG head question. I think that's a, a, a valuable opportunity that should be pursued. And, and uh, there is um, the integration of, of advanced imaging, such as PET or SPEC, could be done and, and could be done to, if you will, almost uh, paint more uh, concentrated blood brain barrier disruption to areas of high concentrated tumors, or for that matter, uh, uh, potentially uh, allow us to. to uh, uh, to, to better understand and predict the modeling as, as near it indicated about what powers might be required because the tumor microenvironments vary so heavily and the degrees of perfusion or, or, or impaired perfusion in glioblastoma varies appreciably. But uh, uh, I think great questions by Dr. Frank. Dr. Chen, do you want to tell us about how you think about the bubble infusion? Um, we have dose? quite a uh, simple strategy uh, for the micro bubble because um, our sonication is um, prepared, uh, the patient position, the, the probe, and uh, only when we prepare it, we inject micro bubble. And uh, the as a assumption of our team is that the, the micro bubble will quickly be uh, phased out within five minutes. So we do two sonications in five minutes. Um, so we did not uh, dig into how the frequency or the, the maximum bolus or the, the method of the micro bubbles to enhance the maximum drug delivery. Our concept is that uh, only if we can open the BBB, the drug will go uh, what we want it to go. And I, want, I would like to touch a bit about the PET. Uh, during the current, uh, we are closing the phase 2A trial, the fast bath trial. Uh, we did use uh, FDG PET to check uh, of the patients some in some time during the disease treatment. And we feel that it could offer the cortical glucose metabolism to uh, complement uh, what we have seen in um, T2 high signal, which was subcortical regions. So uh, uh, Dr. Frank made a great point about FTG. Thank you. Great. Um, Dr. Prada, how do you think about the bubble infusion in your s setting? Oh, <clears throat> that's a very uh, a great point. And, uh, um, I mean, as I mentioned earlier, um, I think uh, we think that um, microbubble distribution uh, plays a major role in the outcome of the BBB opening um, because we know from uh, our study from um, Interoperative use of microbubble to guide the surgery that the distribution of the microbubble in the brain is um, highly heterogeneous. There are areas who uh, are highlighted or they show a high density of microbubble, and which an area with a, a lower density of microbubble. Also, another important uh, point uh, I believe is the type of vessel they are transiting within and they're uh, interacting with and the speed, so the transit time of the microbubble in a certain area, which also is another parameter that changes according to different areas of the brain and different areas uh, of the tumor. So eventually, I know that uh, there are trans transcranial uh, uh, devices that are uh, under investigation, under development to visualize microbubble, but uh, I, we, we believe that the 
amount of microbubble and their speed, uh, their transit time uh, is affected by the ultrasound, uh, affect the outcome of the, of the BBB. Thank you. And Adam, for, for your uh, four minute treatments, are you giving a bolus or an infusion of micro, microbubbles? Yeah, we, we give a bolus uh, over like 20 seconds and then a flush with saline and the machine tells you exactly when to do it so that they're circulating when the sonication is ongoing. So this is already pretty standardized in our approach. What I would say is uh, this is the same as what we do in the intraoperative pharmacokinetic studies and I think this is what we have uh, used to find this four to six fold increase in drug levels in the brain. Uh, uh, you know, I, I was just texting with, with my collaborators at Carthera Mikani. I'm sure that could be further optimized, uh, but I think this is already leading to this uh, nice increase in, in drug levels. Of course, at some point, if you increase the microbubble dose, you're going to have more opening, and eventually you might have bleeding. This is seen in preclinical models, right? So there's always a fine line. Great, thank you. So we just have a few minutes left, and I'd like to give everybody a chance maybe to just give their thoughts, quick thoughts on, on what the future looks like, um, what would be the most exciting thing that could come in the next year or two that would rapidly advance the trials that you're involved in or the studies that you're involved in. Dr. Lipsman, you want to start? Um, yeah, sure. Thanks, uh, Ram. I mean, we do a lot of thinking about this, and um, I have to say, uh, you know, these kinds of uh, forums and sessions are very inspiring to us, uh, to me personally, you know, the, the amount of uh, work going into this area, as Jason highlighted, just the absolute urgent need to develop additional therapeutics here. Um, I, I, I would encourage additional sort of, you know, trans um, institutional collaboration, specifically on the technical side and on the, uh, you know, so we can really uh, as I said, hammered down on a lot of these technical points uh, in terms of the specific ultrasound parameters uh, and uh, that, that we would need in order to really maximize therapeutic delivery. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done on the regulatory side. I mean, it's tremendously difficult sometimes to get a lot of these trials off the ground. I would say 90% of the work is often regulatory. Uh, and we're often limited in what we can do. For example, you know, combining two novel therapeutics or a biologic or, or combining a novel device with a novel therapeutic. These are challenging things that I think are, you know, uh, the shortest path really that gets us from A, a to Z will be, will be overcoming those um, and, uh, and redefining, you know, how, how we evaluate outcomes. So I think that, that the field is an urgent need of a, of a win. Uh, and I think that, you know, the common thread with all of the work that people on the stage and on the call here is, is focused ultrasound with microbubbles and BBB opening. We're all doing the same mechanism, the same thing, and we're all aiming for the same goal. So I think, you know, additional collaboration partnership will, uh, will get us there. Great. Thank you. Dr. Prada? Uh, I totally agree with Dr. Lipson, of course. Um, I think that uh, one major achievement would be to uh, have this treatment uh, more available, uh, less cumbersome, and uh, for sure more repeatable for patients because as of now we're doing the treatment like once a month during the maintenance in chemotherapy, for example, and I, I believe that it should be done daily. So definitely uh, have more uh, ease of use uh, devices. Thank you. Dr. Chen? Yes, um, I think focus ultrasound is providing and emerging to be a fifth modality for glioblastoma uh, after surgery, radiation, uh, chemo, target therapy, and TTF. Then focus ultrasound could be a, a, a major part of the player because it can assist uh, assist um, the chemo target therapy, assist maybe radiation therapy and more things to be done, maybe assist tumor treating fields. So uh, with all that modalities, uh, we neurosurgeons or neuro oncology can, uh, can modify the treatments according to each patient's requirement. And because we know what uh, each modalities can offer us the best strategy. Thank you. Thank you. Right. Dr. Sanaban. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree with my colleagues and I commend their work. I, I follow it closely and I think it's, it's really important to keep collaborating and discussing these things. I think it's still so early uh, in, in the development and I think we, we, we need to be careful to make assumptions that the preclinical 
biology necessarily is the same in humans. I think there's burning questions that are very basic that haven't been answered, like uh, how long does the drug stay in the brain or what happens when you sonicate an enhancing lesion in there? Is there any benefit to, to doing that where the blood member is already open? These, these are the things that honestly I feel we should be investigating. I've seen some work related to some of these questions about the group at Toronto and Dr. Lipsman, but I, I think those are important things. Before we move into efficacy trust, really try to figure out uh, these and what might be the best drug. Great, thank you. We have about 20 seconds left. Dr. Sheehan, do you want to close us out? Uh, you know, you know, I, again, I'm optimistic about the field. I'm delighted uh, at the tremendous amount of work that's been done by our, our colleagues here on the panel and uh, very grateful for the Focus Ultrasound Foundation for putting this together today. I'm, I hope that we'll be able to join in another year or two and see more of the exciting advances uh, that have been made in, in the ensuing time. Great. Thank you very much. Really appreciate all of your time and contributions to this panel, and well, we'll look forward to the next session. Thank you. Thank you.